the last formal lecture or seminar we're going to do as part of this course. Um, essentially, just trying to kind of round up a set of applications. Clearly, there are others, but the idea of this seminar is to, to give you a view into kind of historical biogeography, um, and some of the applications there. Enrique already gave you a little bit of a, an intro. I'm going to give you kind of a, a, a different perspective and more of a fauna uh, wide or flora wide perspective. Uh, essentially, what I'd like to do is to speak to uh, historical patterns of, of connectivity and non connectivity in forest areas worldwide. Uh, essentially, speaking to what was the Pleistocene, or at least the end of the Pleistocene, like for biodiversity. So this has been an issue of um, considerable discussion uh, for a very long time, but particularly in about the last 40 years. Um, most of you have probably heard of the Amazon refugium hypothesis, which is the idea that uh, Pleistocene climatic fluctuations essentially reduced the presently continuous Amazon rainforest to a series of islands, simply refugia of, of forested areas. And that those, uh, those little islands then gave opportunities for speciation. You can see in these maps a couple of different hypotheses that were presented over the years. So later, uh, in the 90s in particular, and into the 2000s, uh, a, lot of, a lot more diversity of opinion uh, appeared. Essentially, people were thinking beyond just climate-driven refugia as a driver of speciation. Um, particularly, we see the emergence of a bunch of hypotheses about, uh, about world rivers as kind of more permanent barriers. And could that have, uh, could that have driven these, these sorts of patterns? And so essentially, this talk is a little bit of a reflection on that. And what I can't say is that we're to an answer yet, uh, but we're certainly to the point where we've got a lot to think about. I think this, uh, this title, a necessarily complex model, this title might sum it all up. Uh, nothing is simple, and particularly when you're trying to look back from 20,000 years later. One thing I'll point out right at the outset is that this idea of Pleistocene speciation, which is to say vertebrates speciating in the last half million to million years, uh, most of the field has, has discounted. And to the point where one of the papers that I am going to show you today was rejected the first time we submitted it, on the grounds that the title said Pleistocene speciation, and all vertebrate systematists know that there was no Pleistocene speciation, which I found pretty remarkable that somebody would, would state so, so definitively. So first of all, let's reflect on that idea of timing. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a quick view of a couple different uh, Geographic papers. And this is, this is a lot of what you'll we'll see essentially a tree and a um, time calibration. Now, this is actually a pretty nice one because it's just percent sequence divergence. It's worse yet when you translate that into years. And there's a lot of subjectivity involved. And you can see here, uh, this is in southern Europe for a fir tree. 
You can see they're positing a refugium here, refugium here, and post-glacial expansion out of the Italian refugium, out of the Balkan refugium, and perhaps creating a hybrid zone or uh, an encounter zone there. In other cases, I can't imagine that anybody could reconstruct that from phylogeographic data. Clearly, that's basically just a, a complex mess, and those, those arrows are, are largely imagined. Uh, another example, nice sampling for this fox across Brazil, Eastern South America. You'll get this sort of uh, phylogenetic hypothesis. And then that is used for a variety of statistical phylogenetic analyses. Uh, in large part, essentially reading the tea leaves, okay? Uh, these, these mismatch distributions can be read in terms of reflecting a likely type of population history. So, so the, the, the world of phylogeography right now is what we call in the U.S. a one-trick pony. Okay, it's, or has been until recently, it's a field that works from the molecular data, but doesn't really marshal other sets of information that could be useful. And so I kind of underline the part about geography. Uh, it'd be really good to bring in geography powerfully to reflect on phylogeography and basically just enrich the field of inquiry. What geography is brought in is present day geography. And generally, there's not much consideration of factors other than space and geographic distance. And generally, there's been only minimal consideration of the historical variation that's, uh, that's taken place across that scenario. So let's, let's start considering the details of historical uh, conditions. I already told you about this paper, uh, which was a review that I did of ecological niche conservatism. You remember that graph? Essentially arguing that ecological niches are largely conserved over time spans going back to approximately the late Pleistocene. Now I want, I want to think a bit more about the sorts of uh, results that we can get just from the molecular part. So here's, a, here's an analysis of uh, a species of duck across North America. And it says late, late Pleistocene divergence. Okay? So, we use the statistical phylogenetic approach that they use to get a time to most recent common ancestor. You can see here's their best estimate, which was the early Wisconsinian, which is back about 70 or 80,000 years. Yeah. This is a particularly good study because they actually show error marks far too often. Uh, molecular data is presented, the results are presented with no uncertainty. And there happens to be a lot of uncertainty. So I want to get you thinking a little bit about that. So here's that kind of median estimate. And then we have some measure of how sure they are around that. I want you to notice how broad it is. Just the middle part of the box plot goes from about 40 to what, about 140. And the full range of possibilities goes from about 30 to maybe 200,000 years ago. So that seems like, OK, it's late, late Pleistocene, like they said in the title. But what does late Pleistocene mean? I mean? Does that go back to the age of the dinosaurs? Well, I love this movie. Uh, there weren't any dinosaurs there still, even though it says Ice Age. But let's look at this. This is evidence for general instability of past climate from a 250,000 ice, 250,000 year ice core record. 
And so we're at about 10,000 years back at the top of this. And then we go down here. So that time span is kind of from here down to here. And what I want you to notice is this is this is present conditions, and here's the last interglacial. Okay? And we can see that we warm and warm. And all of this is cold, relatively, but notice the dynamism that's taking place in there. And so that date estimate that they presented covered all of this variation in climate. We can look at it in terms of sea level as well. The magnitudes of sea level low stands over the last half a million years. And let's see, sea level. Present day is out here, and then here are low global sea levels. And so over the time period that's encompassed by that one estimate, we see both present day and low uh, sea levels on at least two occasions. So just to give you an example of what that means, this is the Philippines, okay? The green areas are current day islands. The gray areas are areas that would have been exposed at those globally cool periods that had low sea levels. So the world was very, very different just not too many years ago. So essentially what what a, a few others and I have been working towards in the last several years is the idea of marshalling completely independent sets of data to reflect on these same processes. Which is to say, we don't want to base too many conclusions on one data stream only. Rather, we want to develop several data streams, and we want to see if they coincide in the, in the signals that they get. So a few years ago, uh, with a former student of mine, I uh, started exploring essentially what does, uh, what do paleoclimate estimates and uh, ecological niche model projections have to say about uh, fragmentation at the last glacial maximum, the last cool period in the Amazon. This is going to come back to Africa, don't worry. And so this is kind of the typical thing that you see. An Amazonian species at present, which has a very continuous uh, spatial projection of its climatic niche. So you project that back to last glacial maximum conditions, and you see some pretty massive fragmentation. We have this northeastern or eastern area, this western area. Okay, this was a long time ago, and so our, our uh, paleoclimate uh, scenarios were pretty crude. You can see big pixels reflected in there. We've improved on that a fair amount. And one result that came out of that study is that we looked for coincident areas that were retained amongst all of the forest species that we looked at. There's a bunch of birds and a bunch of trees. And so these red splotches are those co coincident areas. And the interesting thing is, is that at least in, in coarse terms, they coincide with those refugia that were posited 34 years before by the, the 